Well, good morning and welcome to Sunday School at Cedar Lane. Our lesson this morning is titled Freedom, Love, and Faith. It comes from the book of Galatians at a time when the churches in Galatia were wrestling with the tension of personal freedom and what was required of them as God's children. Unfortunately, divisions had formed, and that being the case, Paul felt it necessary to clear up some things by offering a new perspective to include the nature of the law as well as liberty and love. Before we dive into our lesson this morning, let's think just a minute about unity. It's been said that unity is sometimes confused with uniformity. Can there be unity without uniformity? Let's face it, when everyone within a group acts the same way and has the same preferences, unity seems to come pretty natural. That being said, what happens when you throw in a few variables such as different racial, cultural, economic, and educational backgrounds? I think we'd like to believe that unity is achieved when there are no significant differences between people. It's probably human nature to feel closer to people when we speak the same language, have similar backgrounds, enjoy the same things, similar interests, so on and so forth. It becomes a problem though, when our community or when our desire for these common points of interest suddenly become prerequisites for community. When this happens within a community of believers, the church, for example, we can create the impression that one must conform to the church community in order to receive the saving grace of Christ. For our lesson this morning, it's important to kind of have this concept in mind because we're gonna be looking at the early church and how difficult it must have been for the apostles to create unity as they brought the good news of Jesus Christ to people who were not part of the Israelite community. Think about how long the laws of Moses and the stories of God's redemptive work were a part of the lives of the Israelite people and how God used those two components to shape a nation. Descendants of Abraham had shared dietary restrictions and standards of cleanliness for years. Now, all of a sudden, with Gentiles starting to join their community, their sense of unity was threatened. And as we will see in our lesson this morning, some of these Israelites insisted that the new Gentile Christians had to observe the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament, including the requirement of circumcision. They would argue that circumcision was a standard that God had required of Abraham's family as a sign of the covenant relationship God had established with Abraham, which is true. There was historical precedent, but there was also a new covenant. And that is the reason that Paul takes such a strong position in Galatians chapter five. His argument for dismissing the requirement of circumcision was that it contradicted the truth that Christ's grace was sufficient to save, and it was really creating a stumbling block for the Gentile Christians. In Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem gathered together to make decisions about new Gentile believers. Paul and Barnabas had been teaching the new believers did not need to observe the Old Testament custom of circumcision to faithfully follow Christ. However, they were met with opposition by those with a different perspective who taught that circumcision was necessary for salvation. After some discussion, the church leaders sided with Paul and Barnabas and sent a letter to new believers in Antioch informing them of their decision. Even though the requirement for circumcision was addressed 
Church leaders gave the new believers a list of other requirements to include not eating food that had been sacrificed to idols, blood, nor the meat of strangled animals. And they were also to refrain from sexual immorality. Throughout the letter to the Galatians, Paul's frustration is evident. In chapter two, he and Peter get into it over the issue of eating with Gentiles. At the end of chapter three, the issue of baptism comes up where he makes it clear that all who are baptized in Christ are children of God with no distinction between Jew or Gentile. And this brings us to today's lesson. In Galatians 5, Paul is addressing fellow believers who are teaching that circumcision, circumcision should be a requirement for new believers. We will see that he is obviously angry about this teaching and does not want Gentile Christians to be treated like second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. Paul was adamant that the followers of Christ avoid a kind of hierarchy based on observing ceremonial customs. As far as Paul was concerned, membership in God's kingdom is not something to be earned, but given freely by Christ. In our scripture verses for today, Paul enters a new phase in his teaching to the Galatians. Our author refers to it as a transition. Up to this point, Paul has defended the nature of his ministry and offered a new understanding on the nature of the law and how it pertains to God's children. And as I've mentioned, what Paul has run into here is a group of Galatians who were requiring Gentile believers to adhere to Jewish religious customs and practices. These so-called Judaizers were also about faithfulness to the old covenant and looking to the law of Moses for salvation. Basically, they were attempting to convert Gentiles to Judaism by requiring them to adhere to the works of the law to find salvation. This created a mixed message which caused a real tension between the works of the law and expressions of faith. So let's read our scripture verses. This is Galatians 5, 1 through 15. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever they may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. As they say, them some fighting words. There's a lot there, isn't there? It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm. 
Paul is reminding his audience to stand firm in light of that freedom. Back in Galatians 4.31, chapter right to 4 or 5, obviously leading up to these verses, Paul retells the story of Sarah and Hagar in an effort to show that individuals who express faith in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, live in freedom. One of the things that we'll see, and I'll quote another set of verses here in a little bit, but Paul is trying real hard to appeal to what this group of individuals already know about the Old Testament. He's using stories and metaphors to try to get them to turn on that light bulb. But anyway, just as a reminder of what he's telling them here, Galatians 4, 28 through 31. Now you brothers like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. And the freedom that Paul's speaking of here is the freedom that comes from a believer's life made new in Christ. Paul's statement in verse 1 that Christ has set us free points to what we all know. Freedom does not come without cost. Jesus paid for this freedom with his life. And later on in the uh, first verse, he talks about burdened by the yoke of slavery. Throughout his, or throughout his letter to the Galatians, Paul has emphasized the limitations of the law of Moses. The fact that he uses the word yoke to describe the law points to its demands, especially those placed on Galatian Gentiles. In broad terms, a yoke indicated the submission of a weaker power to a stronger power. God wants us to live freely, and Jesus tells us how in a pretty famous verse, Matthew 11 through 30, or 1130, I'm going to read verse 29 and 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And we can all finish it, right? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and our burdens should be centered on the needs of others. In verse 2, Paul's frustration is starting to show a little bit. Mark my words, complete with an exclamation point. No doubt Paul's admonition is setting up something very significant. And that is the consequences. If you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Paul is telling them that either way, circumcised or not, it doesn't have any value at all regarding one's salvation. Our author puts it like this, when a person depended on the works of the law, including circumcision for their salvation, that act served to set aside the grace of God. Paul preached faith in Christ, not righteousness by the law. If the Galatians followed through with circumcision, with the understanding that it was mandatory for their salvation, then Christ's work in freeing people from the law and dying for their sins would provide them with no, no value, pardon me. And if that wasn't enough, he's gonna repeat it again in verse three. Again, I, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Cherry picking parts of the law was not an option. It was all or none. And if a person is going to put their faith in any part of the law, then they'll be required to meet every requirement. And that can't be done. And if there's any doubt about that, just read Leviticus. <laughs> 
In verse four, Paul is addressing the fact that a person cannot be justified by both Christ and the law. Alienated from Christ and falling from grace are some serious consequences prompting Paul's warning. The Galatians' acceptance as children of God was entirely dependent on God's grace. Any attempts to find justification by the law would be equivalent to falling out of grace's realm. Verse 5. For though the Spirit, for through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. Beautiful verse of scripture. And what you'll notice here in verse five, Paul includes himself. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await. Justification, of course, is the concept that believers are declared righteous before God as their sins are forgiven. Paul was up against individuals who argued that justification could only come through following the law of Moses. He obviously opposed this view and taught that righteousness for both the Jew and Gentile was attained only through the faith in Christ. Justification is a one-time occurrence, which leads to transformation by the Holy Spirit resulting in our sanctification, which is a lifelong process. This is what he's trying to get across to these folks. Try to imagine what the Galatians are thinking at this point. We've got a hardcore Jew with a reputation of persecuting anyone who believed what he's now preaching. Imagine that. And telling them that circumcision was worthless. Say what? For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. That's verse six, and Paul makes it clear. It doesn't matter whether you are or you aren't. Nobody has the advantage. And by doing this, he reinforces that there is neither Jew or Gentile and that we are all one in Christ Jesus. Faith in Christ is all that matters, and that faith in the life of a believer should be expressed through love. Love is the fulfillment of the law. In the next verse, Paul uses one of his favorite metaphors. He's used it throughout his writings in the New Testament, and that is running a race. And he acknowledges, them, <clears throat> he acknowledges here that they were running a good race. They were pursuing Paul's teachings, and they started out so well and had followed what he taught. But when a different message started making the rounds, some of them did not stand fast, and that message became an obstacle. The Judaizers' message was a major distraction, and it just didn't jive with the message that they heard from Paul, who preached the gospel that caused faith, obedience, and love. And then in verse 9, he starts talking about bread. Again, he's trying to find things that these folks relate to. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. He used an old proverb that most of his audience would recognize, describing the effect a little yeast would have on a whole batch of dough to make a point. To Paul, the teaching, teachings of the Judaizers served as leaven among the Galatian believers as they allowed a little opposing teaching to influence or persuade them, specifically the need to be circum circumcised, there would be more of these false teachings to follow and they would be setting themselves up for division amongst themselves. So after that, there's the need for a little positive reinforcement here in verse 10. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. Paul uses positive reinforcement to motivate the Galatians by expressing his confidence that their mindset of faith would prevail 
over the influence of the other teachings. And goes on to say that anyone throwing them into confusion by teaching a different gospel from the one Paul taught would pay the penalty. <clears throat> and this, <clears throat> this next uh, statement, brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? Apparently there were some rumors floating around that even the Apostle Paul was still preaching circumcision. And they were using that really against Paul because they, it wasn't true. So that's why Paul felt the need in verse 11 to address the issue of himself preaching circumcision. And he did this, like I said, because he was being accused by the Judaizers of continuing to preach in favor of them. More than likely, they knew his position and his reputation prior to his conversion and just assumed he was still pro-circumcision. Before his conversion, Paul had persecuted followers of Christ. At this point in his ministry, it was Paul who was suffering the same hardships he caused others to experience. In the same verse, Paul makes a statement regarding the offense of the cross. In Paul's day, a cross used for crucifixion was an offensive image. Not only did it serve as a reminder of the shame of a criminal's execution, those who followed the law of Moses could not even imagine a crucified Messiah. And the point that Paul was trying to make here is that through Christ's death on a cross and resurrection, new life by faith was possible. And that is to all with or without circumcision. Verse 12 is fairly clear. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. There's a couple of different schools of thought here. This statement could mean that Paul wished that the agitator's teaching be cut off. Given his personality and how frustrated he was at the time, he was likely referring to a body part. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Paul's telling the Galatian believers to give up the burden and demands of the law as they were called to do so. It was time for them to live in the freedom that Christ had given. The Lord had been working in the lives of these Galatians, and it was now time for them to move forward in his spirit. Second part of verse 3. 13 starts out with a very, very big but. And that but is do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. So his emphasis is to proceed cautiously, that our human nature is still prone to act in sinful ways. And here he addresses sins of the flesh specifically. He points out that freedom does not give us a license to do whatever we want to do, especially if it causes us to sin. Christian freedom is the call for what our author refers to as outward action. In this case, dealing with the believer's treatment of other people, serving others with love. As the Spirit moves us in the freedom we have with Christ, we are to use that freedom responsibly. And that includes our concern for the good of others. For the entire law is fulfilled in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Given all of the rules and requirements of the law, can't you picture these Judaizers all scratching their heads and saying to each other, wait, what? One thing, only one thing, love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law, that kind of wraps it up. These folks had to just be in shock. And finally, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. Paul draws one of his 
bottom line conclusions in verse 15. If we as believers are not filled with love, our actions will tear others down. If the Galatians didn't get the message according to our author, the result would be mutually assured destruction and they would be destroyed by their fleshly desires. <clears throat> Back on May 1st, our lesson involved the book of Romans. And one of the verses that you may remember <clears throat> from there, um, I want to conclude our lesson by reading a commentary for this particular verse because it wraps things up so neatly. That verse is Romans 6.14, and it reads, For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. Here's the commentary to that. I believe this commentary is from um, Andy Stanley's book. Most of you probably heard of Charles Stanley. Uh, Andy Stanley is his son, and he wrote a book a while back, and it's entitled Grace. And this is just a, a really neat commentary here. If we allow sin to reign over us, we are putting ourselves, we are putting ourselves right back in slavery despite the freedom given to us by Christ. Instead, we are to be ruled by grace. It's not about which law or set of rules we try to keep, but about which master we serve. Apart from grace, we cannot overcome sinful desire. By grace, death has been destroyed. Sin's hold has been broken, and the law has been fulfilled through the perfect obedience of Jesus. Even when we avoid sinful behavior, we are mastered by sin if we are doing this in an attempt to earn favor with God. Sort of sounds like the law to me. Then. If our motivation is to serve God, then righteous behavior will follow. 